Our next talk will be from our very own Miss Melody Banks. Miss Banks is the Upper School World History II teacher. Born in San Antonio, Texas, she moves with her family to Arkansas, Colorado, and finally to North Carolina, where she earned her Bachelor of Arts in International Studies and Peace, War, and Defense from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She earned her Master's in Political Science in Boone, North Carolina at Appalachian State University. After graduation, Ms. Banks worked in South Sudan for two years and Haiti for two months as an aid worker. She focused on refugees and genocide in South Sudan and Sudan and on the Gloria epidemic in Haiti. Other travels included a summer in Uganda, an internship at the U.S. Embassy in Madrid, a summer in New York City at the Lincoln Center, and a short disaster term with responses to other nations, including Vanuatu. She has also worked extensively as a tutor and academic advisor, primarily for at-risk students. She has tutored at the University of South Carolina, Appalachian State, and through Upward Bound. Please give it up for Ms. Melody Banks. I moved there in January of 2012, and it was created in uh, July of 2011. And the question I get most often when people hear that is, so, how was it? And when they ask me that, this is what happens to my brain. So, I'm here to answer that question. How was South Sudan? When people walk past me quickly, I usually say, oh, it was nice. Thank you for asking. <laughs> In reality, it was a lot more than that. The basics, it averages 85 to 120 degrees. By the time I left, I got a big blanket when it was 85 degrees at night. The, there's like swarms of animals that come in different seasons. It's the bees, so you have to sort the bees that drown in your water before you drink it. Uh, you're sick most of the time. Uh, it smells bad because you wash your body with dirty water from the Nile River, and we don't have designated places for using the bathroom. So not only are you sweating all day, you then clean in that water, and everyone uses the bathroom everywhere. Uh, the, when, <laughs> the frogs would come, and you would go to your showers, like a cement block where you take a bucket bath, and literally if you picked your foot up and set it back down, you would step on a frog. So I just shuffled to the, to the shower. <laughs> the mosquitoes are literally there to kill you. Malaria was one of the number one killers in South Sudan. So it wasn't just annoying to get a bite, it was dangerous to get a bite. Uh, the cockroaches, they would come up out of the shower drain as you stood on them, up under your feet. I would average four to five uh, cockroach deaths per shower. <laughs> in addition to that, it was terrifying. Everybody carried a gun. Uh, kidnappers were, were prevalent in the area. Uh, there was war happening. Uh, scorpions, cobras, all your regular natural seers to have. So, and it just made extremely physically uncomfortable. I was always mentally terrified. <laughs> My job was basically to sort information from the United Nations, from NGOs, from my South Sudan colleagues, from other media sources, siphon that out and redistribute it into appropriate places. So my boss would call me and say, hey, I'm giving a talk to the United Nations Security Council. I need notes right now or to a congressman back at home. So I would send redistribute information um, to the people that needed it. Things at the beginning were pretty good. Um, I, I got used pretty quickly to the living circumstances, and I would take images like this. These are refugee camps who were holding a food distribution, and this is the average way that most families were cooking in these refugee camps. I would take images like this, women waiting for water, Women averaged five liters per day per person for cleaning, bathing, washing, cooking. Flush your toilet one time, that's five liters of water in a nation that averages 110 degrees a day. I would take all this information and I would put it into a Word document, bullet point form, so that people in other places could understand what was happening in South Sudan. At the beginning, I felt like superwoman because I was, I moved there when I was 24 and I felt pretty powerful. Um, I was surviving in this horrible environment. Uh, I knew everything. It was my job to know South Sudan and Sudan. 
And when people came to South Sudan, all of these weathered like cowboy journalists who moved in and out of the area, they wanted to know what are the rebels doing? What are the refugee camps doing? What's going on with the United Nations? All these like home, all this like low ground information. It wasn't information that was published in any source. But I was the girl. So when all these people would come in and out of South Sudan, they want to know what's up, I knew what was up. Uh, and as a 24-year-old girl, uh, men that have lots of world experience typically don't come to you and say, hey, tell me everything you know. But in this environment, I was that girl, and they needed me, and people needed to know what I knew. It made me feel very powerful. And then I started to see these types of images. I started to see people lose their homes because a bomb was dropped on them. People lose their lives over and over, fathers, husbands, brothers, sons. And with one bomb dropped, everything that those families had worked for for the entire year, their only food source was destroyed. I started seeing children killed, maimed, murdered, starved to death in these environments. And I turned it into a spreadsheet. A spreadsheet that calculated what bombs dropped, what planes dropped these bombs, how many bombs dropped per day, how many people were killed, how many people were killed under the age of 18. Uh, not really so much like a woman anymore. I'm sorry to say, uh, you yeah, see what's happening here? This is insane. So I keep going, and I start seeing images like this on a daily basis. These are the children of war, of poverty, of famine. And I didn't cry when I see these, saw these little kids. Instead, I turned it into a spreadsheet. And I thought, maybe if other people see what's happening in this big numerical format, maybe something will change. <coughs> I'm not so happy anymore either. Things are starting to feel kind of angry all the time. Uh, I just did my job as best as I could and I survived. I start to meet all these women who tell me their stories. They say, they call them the Jalaba. The, the men of the north who came to kill them. Shalaba came, and they dropped bombs in our villages, and they burned our village to the ground. So we picked up our children and walked 10 days without food and water as they bombed us along the way until we became refugees in South Sudan. Over and over and over, every single one of these women had that exact same story. I wrote that story probably dozens of times in my two years there. It stopped sounding impressive. I would have to, I would go out to these villages, so why do I even bother to come interview them? I can write their story without even asking their questions. I know, I know, the Jalaba, they came, they burned your house, the bombs, your husband died, your children are starving. Yeah, yeah, I know, I've heard it. Impress me, tell me something new. I've sent the exact same story home 12, 14, 15, 16 times. It's not making a difference, so can you all think of something else that I could write? And then I start to experience the things that I could not put in a report. Things like the wool here. I went to see her over and over and over and over, and she never got better. She was in our, she was in our refugee camp uh, in a hospital specifically for malnourished children. So what is wrong? Why is she not getting better? She's getting all the extra food. She's getting all the nutritional things we give to children who are malnourished. Come to find out, her mother was intentionally choosing to keep Kabul in a place between starvation and barely alive. She wasn't dying, but she wasn't living. Because the extra food that they received because she was malnourished went to her husband, who lived on the other side of the border and was fought leading with a rebel militia against the Sudanese government. Granted, the government he was fighting was dropping bombs on his family on a daily basis. But as a North American NGO, to have our food labeled with our logo on the other side of the very wrong border in the hands of these guys, it's not exactly what NGOs and charities are all about. So what do we do? Do we stop feeding Kabul? Because we know in reality that the food is going to her dad on the other side of the border? I would spend days in our UAMS camp, unaccompanied minors, girls that left Sudan as refugees and without their parents. So we were thinking we will create a safe space for children without parents. Great idea, right? Turns out, groups of girls collected together in a refugee camp is another word for brothel. And soldiers would come in and out of these homes for girls, 
and basically force them to have sex. So 14-year-old girls start getting pregnant, and then they start drinking bleach, because they can't be pregnant. And then they're discovered, and they are beaten by the police and thrown in jail. So what do we do? Do we stop creating a place to keep girls that don't have parents with them? Or do we leave them there and leave them vulnerable to these other to these men coming in and out? By this point, it's pretty depressing. You just exasperate it. What do we do? No matter what decision we make, one way or the other, somebody's still getting hurt. And then we came to guys like this, the leaders of the um, camp in, in South Sudan. And some of these leaders would come to us and they would say, you stole our plastic chairs. I didn't steal your plastic chairs, but I want my plastic chairs. They say, well, because you stole our plastic chairs, you have to give us extra food rations. It's not, we didn't steal their plastic chairs, it's a bribe. Or they would come to us and they would say, well, if you really want to work in this hospital that your NGO is paying for and supplying staff for, you have to pay us extra money. If you want to drill a well here in this community, you have to pay us something. We're a nonprofit charity. We're not in the business of giving bribes. So what do we do? Do we pay a bribe so we can keep the hospital running? Or do we not pay a bribe and let the hundreds of girls and women and men who come in that hospital are saved, do we let them perish? And then the, the national government starts making these decisions. And they decide that if we are going to have foreign aid workers in our country, and at this point foreign aid workers are the only source of food, health care, education, transportation, any kind of basic infrastructure for the nation. We were the only form of all those areas. If you're going to bring an aid worker into this country, you have to pay the government a monthly stipend in order for these employees of these charities to be in our country. They were charging $100 per month per employee that you brought in. So do we pay it? Or do we all leave and let the famine that we are just barely stopping happen? I'm angry by this point. Everything that I see makes me angry. The men of South Sudan were just really making me mad. <laughs> Nothing ever made sense. It didn't matter what we did, it only seemed to get worse. And then the week I left South Sudan, it completely fell apart. They had been in, at war, the South Sudanese had been at war with the Sudan, Sudanese for two years to gain independence. And in one week, the, the two tribes of South Sudan turned against each other. And in a week, they completely destroyed South Sudan. These two tribes had been fighting wars for the, their entire lives, and now they were fighting each other. They were prepared, guns are all they have over there. They were prepared to fight. The damage that they caused in these two years of civil war had been horrific. They recruited child soldiers, which was something we knew it was happening already, but we had to ignore it. The government could not pay their soldiers, so they instead allowed them to rape the women they captured as payment. They would tie women up on the side of the road so that they could be raped as men passed them by. They would rape children literally to death. They destroyed the hospitals we worked in. They were looted, ravaged, everything that was in there was taken out. And in the maternity wards, women were tied to the beds and shot in the beds as they went through. And to make it all worse, it got personal as well. Our driver, Dang Angelo, is a Dinka. And in the middle of the war, he was in the wrong place and he came across a new air with a gun. And they shot him. Dang was a fantastic man. He was probably seven and a half feet tall with enormous feet. He looked out for me in many, many ways when I was first trying to understand this horrible place. And now he's gone too. By this point, it's, I'm not even angry anymore. I'm just completely depressed. I've given up. I worked so hard for two years, and then I come home, and it's worse than when I got there. Right now, I'm back at home. And things are beautiful. 
I know Bowdoin, North, Bowdoin, North Carolina probably doesn't sound like a very exciting place, but oh my gosh, they have hot water, they have air conditioning, they have green trees, it's not the desert, and there are no bugs in my house. I felt like I was from paradise. On top of that, I was planning my wedding, right? The most exciting event of a woman's life, right? I'm picking out dresses and cake toppers and, you know, all these pretty things. But my mind is exploding because I had gotten so used to every day feeling afraid and feeling uncomfortable. And those are the feelings that made me be able to see all these children, all these women, and continue to do my work. If I had stopped to think about what I was seeing and process it and go through the emotions of the pain that these people have been through, there's no way I would have had my job, gotten my job done. So my mind is exploding because of the, the barriers I had built, built up of being used to being afraid and uncomfortable were starting to melt away because I was neither. And I just, I just was not able to process everything. I was not a normal bride. I would go, you know, try on wedding dresses, and then I'd stay up all night having nightmares because I could not get these images out of my head. It wasn't through myself, but through some wise people around me who started to say, hey, Melody, uh, you don't seem okay. Uh, you seem really irritable. I'm not irritable. Okay, okay, maybe you should just go talk to somebody. Why do you think I'm crazy? I don't need to talk to anybody. Uh, this is a sign that you are. <laughs> so eventually, I was started talking. And I started allowing myself to be sad and to mourn the loss that I had experienced and mourn the pain that I had experienced. And by permitting myself to mourn, it allowed me to also rejoice. And with the pain that I allowed myself to begin to process, I also began to remember the things that were beautiful in my experience. Days and days with all these kids who were happy, they were so excited to see you. I'd go visit them in their camps, and when I came, they'd come running out, Daddy, Daddy, you know, they're so excited to see me. Of meeting new kids, and they just come and say, many places I had been there had never been a non-Sudanese woman. All right, so there's a lot about me to them that was very strange. So the kids come and they just look and they stare and they stare. Some of them get braver and they come close and they like touch your skin to see if it bites off maybe. And maybe it's paint or something. And they put their hands through my hair, try to figure out what is this? Like, is this real? Is this, what has she got on her? Or I have hair on my arms, where most of us do, but they don't. And they can pull the hair and say, why is she? <laughs> I spent hours of it in the kitchen with these ladies, and I would tell them, I would, through sign language, I spoke pretty bad Arabic, and they spoke mostly no English, but through little sign language, I would say, how many kids do you have? I said, oh, Mafi, Mafi, I don't have any kids. Ah, Malesh, sorry. I said, no, 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 Mafi, well, she left, no problem, no problem. Mafi husband, Mafi husband. And they say, oh. My lash, my lash. <laughs> At the age of 26 in a country whose life expectancy is 54, I was a very old maid. <laughs> and they were highly concerned about my future. <laughs> One of our colleagues, he said, Melody, I really think you should marry this particular man. I would like to reduce the number of things I pray for each night. <laughs> I got to fly a plane lots of times. Our co-pilots would turn it over and let me drive for a little bit or fly for a little bit. Pretty exciting. I met pretty yeah, interesting people. I met Desmond Tutu and Greta Van Susteren and George Clooney. These people all came out as um, ad advocates. I got to kill my first goat and then eat it later, which for some of you may be on the trauma side of, of events, but for me it was the exciting event. I played the hokey pokey with kids all over the place. It turns out I'm really good at the hokey pokey. And I still remember scenes like this, where Tutu came in, and I went to see him every day. He weighed, I don't know, five, six pounds, and he would stand up and stagger to the end of his cot, and raise his hands up so I could pick him up, and I would hold him, and he would just collapse. Like that was all the energy he had in him. And three months later, I came back, and I looked, and I looked, and I thought, where's Tutu? I can't find him. And all of a sudden, I see this little boy come up and look at me and do like this, and it was Tutu. He had been made whole again because of the work we were doing. We, we didn't take away the poverty he experienced. 
and we took away his hunger. Some words by Mother Teresa are what brought me back to life. What you spend years creating, others could destroy overnight. Create anyways. The good you do today will often be forgotten. Do good anyway. Give the best you have, and it will never be enough. Give your best anyway. Because that's, those are the things I had forgotten while I was in South Sudan. I thought I could save the entire nation, and I failed entirely. The tutu was alive. I saw the, the camps that we worked on completely destroyed by the, by the Civil War. But we had at least given them two years of, of safety. The things I try to remember the most now are, yes, it was hard, but images like this, and in the middle of a refugee camp, these are all children of war, of violence, of poverty. In the middle of a refugee camp, these kids would make their own schools. I don't know if you can read it, but the board, that chalkboard, it says, this is a cup, this is a table. And they would practice writing it out over and over in the sand. Because these kids in the middle of war, they said, someday, I'm going to need to say, this is a cup. And that means they believed that they had a tomorrow. So who am I to give up on them when they've never given up on themselves? So what did I learn from South Sudan? How was my experience? South Sudan destroyed all of the hope that I have had in humanity. And little by little, through a very painful process, it rebuilt it into something that lasts longer. It's a hope that can experience severe pain and hardship and think that they still hope for tomorrow, so so can I. Thank you. Um, your speech makes me very sad as a senior that I will not have your class, and, but to everybody in the audience who has the privilege to take your class and learn from your experience, thank you for sharing today. It's absolutely incredible. Can we give her another round of applause?